groups form councils? Does it work for or against the decentralization? All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm back. And today's topic is the Bitcoin Mining Council. Um, we don't we really need to do introductions, I guess, because that's already been taken care of. Thank you so much. And I guess we'll just get right to the meat of the topic. Um, I think there's a lot of people that don't really fully understand what the Bitcoin Mining Council even is in some respect. They see a lot of buzz around it on Twitter and things like that or some various social media aspects. But maybe it would just be good to maybe reach a consensus on what the Bitcoin Mining Council actually is. So if you could each spend maybe just like 30 seconds on what is the Bitcoin Mining Council. We'll start with Jamie, she's got the microphone. Sure, happy to. Um, so the Bitcoin Mining Council is a loose affiliation. It's a group of miners that have come together with a common um, understanding, which is that we are interested in promoting transparency, promoting education, and talking about the benefits of Bitcoin and the benefits of, of Bitcoin mining. And that's really the extent of what the Bitcoin Mining Council is. It's open to everybody. Um, we, we're public, we're transparent, and, and that's really what the council's all about. So yeah, to add to Jamie's points, uh, the Bitcoin Mining Council is comprised of approximately 30 Microphone miners. closer to them. Uh, the, the BMC, or the Bitcoin Mining Council, is comprised of approximately 30 miners uh, from around the world. Uh, representing around 33% of the existing hash rate globally. Um, and the data that we've been collecting is statistically significant for us to be able to draw interesting conclusions as to the sustainable power mix that's driving Bitcoin generation. And really that's the underlying narrative that people need to understand is that there has been so much misinformation around what is actually comprised of the power mix for Bitcoin mining that this is a necessity for us to have put together. I mean, virtually every single sector globally has its own association or collective voice. And I mean, Michael Saylor, he's been a great um, you know, promoter and cheerleader of this, obviously given his intrinsic bias to make sure Bitcoin is understood properly. Uh, but you know, he says something really interesting that resonates with a lot of people in that even though we're decentralized, we don't have to be disorganized. And that's something that really hits home uh, because the more we're able to work together share collective data that truly represents what's going on, the better we can actually have a narrative that makes sense that people can really get behind to know that Bitcoin isn't boiling the oceans. In fact, Bitcoin is supporting the renewable energy industry to make sure that our power costs go down and it's driven by the sun, the wind, water. Yeah, I think uh, Teres summed it up really nicely. I think the one thing I would just pile onto that is that in any industry, as it develops and it, as it matures, you need standardization around some things. Standardization around reporting information so people understand what's going on. Standardization around energy uses. But there's even things that go beyond that. So standardization around types of hardware, for example. You know, imagine a world where mining hardware was like the PC industry. You could buy an immersion um, rack, you could buy ASIC boards, you could buy GPU boards, they'd all go in, you could plug it in, you could optimize. There were specialized operating systems for miners. That type of standardization becomes really interesting as an industry matures. And I think while the Bitcoin Mining Council's focus isn't technology standardization, it's really just sharing information and educating. And as the miners talk, there's the ability to kind of share ideas amongst each other and with the public about what's going on and how to make the industry better and especially as it relates to the renewable energy question, I think it's really sharing best practice, what you can do, and then collecting the data so we can really see the impact we're having. Awesome, all right, hi everyone. Uh, so as a non-miner, I'm here to represent the other side uh, from a, as a node operator, as a Bitcoin user, and as someone that's been covering the Bitcoin space for seven, eight years now, and to people like myself, the, the Bitcoin Mining Council is a step towards compromising uh, on certain issues that a lot of people in Bitcoin don't really want to compromise on. Uh, it's a path towards strict regulation, and to us, it's a path towards uh, so, some standardization and uh, 
that is one of the issues we're going to discuss. Yeah, definitely. So we have our first contentious point brought up. Um, real quick, before we start diving into it, uh, it seems like from my, you know, I won't actually offer my perspective maybe till the end, I'll remain like an unbiased moderator, but I will ask some of the people on uh, stage who are part of the Bitcoin Mining Council, if you could go back and announce it again, how would you do it differently? Well, I would have preferred to do it without the Elon narrative at all and just say, hey, it's a group of miners who really think that we should be focused maybe on renewable energy and looking at different energy types and discussing how to do it without the confusion of the, are we responding to Elon or are we rebutting him? What are we doing? I think that would have been a better. Yeah, I mean, to echo Fred's points, I mean, really, if we could go back and change anything, it would be to have a world where data was actually shared and we actually knew what the power mix was. I mean, that's the problem. Really, the biggest narrative and point of FUD that the Bitcoin Mining Council is really trying to change and really expose is that Bitcoin mining isn't primarily driven off of coal or carbon-based power. It is actually sub substantially driven off of sustainable energy. And so if there's any way to go back in time to make sure people understand that, I think that's what I would change personally. Because then really we wouldn't need the Bitcoin Mounting Council because people understand what the data is. I think this is the first time I'm ever going to disagree with you publicly. I haven't done it before. Um, I think, uh, well, I'll do this in two parts. First of all, one of the things that I would like would change in hindsight would be to get the, mi the mission out first. So introduce the fact that we're a loose organization, that everybody's welcome, uh, that it's about education, transparency, and best practices. Start there and then introduce the conversation about sustainability and potentially then maybe reference or not reference Elon. But I think we, we inverted the order um, and that's, that's one of the things that I, I would change, but again, in hindsight. Um, but I think, I think the Bitcoin Mining Council and the collective voice and the mission that we have isn't just about energy. Energy is the FUD of the day. It's, it's the current uh, narrative that we're facing. But the council, in, in the mission statement, we don't reference the energy narrative because it's not here just for this narrative. It's here to have a collective voice, to share best practices, to be transparent. Um, and that's for whatever the next FUD cycle is. We want to be able to have a collective voice and a way to address it um, with, the, with these core principles as an industry. And I think that's critically important and it's something that we've been lacking uh, because it's hard for, um, I think, people to take things seriously if it's coming just from me. So if I'm talking about HUD-8 mining, then I have inherent bias that is mine representing HUD-8. And, and without that collective voice or that collective data that, that can be perceived as objective, it's hard for you know, mainstream media to have an objective counterpoint that they can see credibility in. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and just to hand it over to Tone, um, you said that you were kind of worried that uh, this council could facilitate stricter regulations and, you know, raises some concerns amongst those, like, say, a node operator, given that perspective. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you see as the more potentially coercive factors of the council and what those, those may sure. be? Sure. I'll, I'll throw a couple of issues that uh, lots of friends of mine are concerned about. Maybe you guys could uh, go ahead and address them. Uh, so one of them, as was mentioned, um, oh, the Elon angle, of course, is troublesome because he just randomly spit out some facts that were grossly wrong. Uh, he's already been corrected on those facts and he has been oblivious to the fact that he's been corrected on those facts. Uh, and even if with the right facts, he still seems like he doesn't understand it. Uh, but in any case, uh, you mentioned that about 30% of the miners have uh, voluntarily joined uh, the council. Uh, one of the concerns is what happens when it's 70%? When 70% has voluntarily joined, how much pressure are they, is the council going to put on the final 30% uh, to share the information? Because 
some miners are actually mining pools and they should not be sharing that information because we're living in a world where information is not respected. Facebook doesn't respect their information, neither does Google or Microsoft or Amazon. And Bitcoin is meant to be different. And yet if all this information is being shared, uh, once again, no one seems to respect privacy. Uh, another issue is... Why don't, we, um, why don't we start with that one? Just okay, so let's we, start we with that one. We don't gishgal a bit. Let them answer that one. So let's start with the fact that the blockchain is the most transparent form of sharing data there is. And if that's the premise of Bitcoin, to have fungibility, to have something that can't be changed, and have something that is transparent, then sharing information is very much in line with that. Most statistical data provided is done with sample sizes much smaller than 10%. And having 30% uh, of the large, especially the larger miners, you're getting a very significant um, idea of what's happening in the industry. And for the people who don't want to join, it doesn't matter. They don't have to join. There's no pressure. It's just a question of we want to get a narrative in the marketplace about our energy use because there's FUD against us. And so we want to educate the marketplace. Yeah, Tony, you hit a, a central point to something that we've grappled with as we were putting together the presentation and data points, and that anonymity is 100% top of mind when we're collecting data. Um, you know, a good chunk of the data that's been submitted was actually done uh, to Michael Saylor directly, so I did not have access to the individual miners themselves given my potential conflicts with my work with Core Scientific. He completely anonymized that data. We've had a ton of inbound requests for the list for who's submitting what information and they're not getting any of it back. And the reason being is because anonymity when on submission is paramount. The folks who want to be disclosed as being part of the BMC will 100% be disclosed, their logos, they can definitely use it to be able to tell the world that they are part of this aggregate data collection to ensure that we have the right data. And that's really what it's about. Um, the BMC is in no way going to be influencing regulations. That's happening already anyways. You know, the securities regulators are looking at digital assets and they're going to do what they do. The BMC, in fact, I'd argue on the contrary, will give a data point that says we are actually providing ESG compliant services if this is deemed a financial instrument over the longer term, right? So I, I think your privacy point is 100% on point and that's what we're really concerned about as well, but the over-regulations, I don't think the BMC will have any influence on that. Yeah, and I would just add, we have miners that are part of the council that, that choose not to be to publicly have their logo on the site or to say that they're part of the council, but their data is submitted, they participate when and, when and if they want to in, in a variety of things. So there is absolutely no pressure. Everyone chooses to use it in, in the way that they choose to use it or not use it, and frankly, we may not even know who all of the members are. Okay, um, so a lot of the answers and kind of discussion around this topic has been revolved around sort of the data and the data that miners are submitting to sort of, um, it seems like the kind of catalyst for the creation of this council was largely in response to the massive wave of energy FUD that was hitting us from all sides essentially for quite some time. Um, uh, so naturally it's a, a large part of the data being provided and focus is on the types of energy that miners use and it seems that there's a really, really strong focus on renewable energy in this data. Um, how would you accommodate or account for other types of energy usage that re significantly reduce emissions but aren't renewable energy? Um, do you still account those as being good for investors, regulators? Um, how would you incorporate something like reducing gas venting or oil flares in the Permian Basin, which you know can reduce emissions dramatically, but you still use oil or gas as an energy source. How would you sort of evaluate that data in that context? Uh, yeah, I think if you think about Bitcoin mining, we're, we are the energy consumer of last resort. So we're constantly being driven by an objective of finding the lowest cost energy that's available to us on a reliable basis 24-7, 365. Um, there are lots of ways to generate power using methane off-gassing, for example. It's hard to do 100 megawatts of that. You can do five, you can do 20. Um, and so it's a question of scale. If you want to operate at large scale, then you look at 
large-scale renewable power, wind, solar, et cetera. Um, if, you are the, if you have the ability to be opportunistic and you have excess capacity um, of power, it might be uh, you know, community-scale solar, for example. It might be wind, it might be hydro, it might be geothermal. There are lots of renewable energies types that haven't been developed and deployed because they are typically located too far away from the point of consumption that they can't get distribution of that power. But now with Bitcoin mining, you can take energy which would effectively be free and use that for Bitcoin mining in a way um, that uses um, renewable energy. You can then create, you generate then renewable energy credits that you can even market and sell to offset carbon consumption. All right, I'll go next then. Uh, I was gonna defer to Jamie, but. Um, so that's something else we really grappled with because the more data and explicit data that we collect on a per miner basis, the higher the likelihood is of if the data were to ever get leaked, you'd be able to potentially trace it back based on the power mix itself. And that's a key concern and that's why the data itself that we put together was really around sustainable energy and we define that as renewable and nuclear. And so really when we're talking about sustainability, it's about decarbonizing the power mix that is required to power Bitcoin hash rate. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a ton of really interesting technology out there that, you know, you can call green, you know, taking the effluent off of uh, oil manufacture, oil production, uh, clean coal, you know, there's a ton of different types of energy mixes you can certainly build into that bucket, but we had to make a choice as to where is that line drawn and for, for us to be able to collect clean data to validate the point that we're making around sustainability of the Bitcoin network, um, we had to stick with sustainability meaning uh, renewable plus nuclear. Yeah, so I think uh, the net of it is we just took a really blunt perspective um, and, it, and I think it's really on the individual miners to di disclose that type of work and those efficiencies that are happening at a miner level, at a site level, uh, and for, the, for those miners to work it into their disclosures and their narratives directly. And then over time, uh, as an industry, we can get more sophisticated on, on how we track and how we talk about these things. But this was our first iteration. Uh, it came together in a really short period of time, basically from inception to the publishing of this data was seven weeks, which is incredibly fast. Uh, so I think over time we will be able to get more and more sophisticated, but the answer is we just kind of took a really blunt view to try to get, get ourselves a baseline that would be difficult for um, the FUD machine to uh, debate and you can keep the microphone over there so we can switch up the order a bit. Um, and this, is, this will be addressed to all of you. I'd like to hear all of your opinions on this. Um, uh, it's more about like what you each, like Tone, and then also members of the Bitcoin Mining Council, would see as the most effective strategies for combating some of this FUD that we've spoke about. You know, we've seen the Crypto Climate Accord and some other organizations that say like Ripple is a part of, and they go on Bloomberg, they go on all these news circuits, and they say that before that it was controlled by China and that it was all on coal energy and it was horrible for the environment and it seems like although extremely inaccurate they're pretty effective at sort of amplifying that message across you know social media and the news circuits so uh in your mind tone and and fred and taras and jamie uh besides maybe just publishing data what are other some what are some other effective strategies you think would be uh good to use in the fight against some of this energy fud well, I think having this data at our fingertips uh, as a collective where we actually, we all have the data, we all have uh, an understanding of what, the, what that data means, how it was built. We now are armed with information that is objective, that's factual, that's well understood, uh, that we can use um, collectively in our uh, debates or our, our presentations with in investors, institutions, and the media. And I think one of the great things about the council is it's completely decentralized. Anyone who's a member um, generally gets asked about it. So if, it, if it's public that you're a member, I know when any time I do media, they ask me about the council. So it gives an opportunity to share the data, to counteract the FUD. Uh, and so we've created uh, a, 
this group of uh, ambassadors that are able to collectively counteract the FUD and just kind of tackle it um, as a group of individuals as opposed to a single spokesperson ex as an example. Yeah, and I really echo Jamie's point on that. It's, again, using consistent messaging, consistent da data points to ensure that you're not getting a different message from Fred, from Tone, from Jamie, from Taras. It, it's, a, it's a data point that can be used with confidence. Um, the other thing is, is the consistency of it as well as the professionalism of it. Like we spent a lot of time, even though it was seven weeks, there was a lot of time in ensuring that we found the research. Uh, we reached out to some of the external academics that are actually really focused on this space uh, to ensure that our methodology was accurate and the information we put out can actually be relied on by the markets, uh, by their communities, by retail hodlers, um, and by you know, Bitcoin maximalists as well. There's an old expression which is um, that faith is trust without data, and trust is faith plus data. Um, whenever somebody wants to create FUD, um, it's simply creating uncertainty in people's minds, right? It's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And the best way to combat that is with certainty and data. But you have to have enough people saying the same thing. And so the value in the Bitcoin Business Council publishing the data is it's more of an industry voice than the voice of just one miner raising their hand. You know, the public company miners, um, we have to disclose our energy mix because the investors require it from us. And so we have to do it publicly and we're fine to do it. Um, but that we're just one company. But as a group, it's the power of the group and it makes the FUD spreading a lot harder. All right, so I'm gonna stick with the topic, but I'm gonna uh, fire a question away one more. Um, so one more area of concern for, again, people like myself and a few others, is e uh, uh, ESG, environmental social governance. And it's basically a group of basically environmentalists for whom nothing is never enough. Uh, I, I honestly think their ultimate goal is to reduce human population to less than one billion people. And even that wouldn't be enough. And uh, catering to that group is very problematic and they are they will go to th there's no lengths they would go to to like force like for example right now we have politicians that are talking about shutting down uh coal plants in uh, puerto rico and they're like we already don't have enough electricity you want to remove 30 to 40 percent and they're like, yeah, yeah yeah you'll figure it out um so how do you, like, like the, the view is, like, trying to meet that group in the middle is not the right way to go, and this ESG initiative is already, like, like changing stuff. How do, what do we do? Maybe if I can add, that's pretty similar to a question I was about to ask, too, if I can kind of add on to that, and um, kind of about not meeting some of these people in the middle that seem to have bad intentions, um, or rather that don't necessarily care about, you know, the type of energy that Bitcoin mining is using, but they think any energy usage of Bitcoin mining is a waste of energy. When you look at the words of Senator Elizabeth Warren more recently, um, some other politicians, it's very, very, very clear that if Bitcoin mining used any amount of energy, no matter what source, it would be a waste and a problem. So. Um, how do you meet someone like that in the middle? Is it a waste of time to meet someone like that in the middle? And how can we make it more about actually addressing issues around climate change as opposed to just some ESG concerns or uh, structure where so long as you pay, it's not about actually reducing emissions, but paying for the emissions you do emit. So you could power the whole United States by just putting a solar field in the panhandle of Texas. The problem is you can't distribute the electricity. So we have infinite electricity on this planet, energy as a source. This is more about ESG and the environment and the planet. And if you believe that you want to reduce carbon generation and you want to reduce the impact, then we all can choose to do whatever we want to do to do that. 
And I think if you have somebody who says, well, Bitcoin mining wastes energy, you can address that with data and, and educate people. A lot of people, you know, the vast majority of people in this country couldn't tell you the fact that just getting electricity from a power plant to your plug in the wall has huge energy loss. There's 200 gigawatts of power daily wasted in this country just through transmission losses. You know, I believe you take everybody in the Bitcoin Mining Council, our energy consumption is less than 200 gigawatts in total. And that's just what's wasted getting the electricity to your plug in the wall. And so I think it's education is critical for people to really understand the nature of the conversation. But if you're complaining about the fact that Bitcoin mining creates more carbon emissions, and if Bitcoin mining becomes predominantly renewable and clean energy, then you know, you've educated. You're not going to convert somebody who's not convertible, right? At the end of the day, people have very strong opinions that can border, be borderline on fanatics. There are certainly people who call Bitcoin maximalist fanatics on one hand, and there are people who call non-Bitcoin maximalists heretics on the other hand. So it's, that exists. Yeah, I mean, the ESG point is a very, very topical point, given how much impact it's actually having on capital markets these days. Um, you know, Bitcoin mining is naturally a capital intensive activity. But the one thing that I have to reinforce is that Bitcoin mining does not take that much energy. If you look at the total energy produced and consumed globally, Bitcoin mining globally all around is 0.01% of energy use and consumption which is nothing. If Bitcoin mining stopped tomorrow, there would be zero impact on the planet whatsoever. Like that's one thing that people have to understand is Bitcoin mining or minting does not take up that much power. And so when we're working with the Bitcoin Mining Council and putting out this information, it's not to try to sway the opinions of folks on the fringe that are gonna chain themselves up to uh, you know, a coal plant or anything else like that. It's, it's about making sure the population, the masses understand that Bitcoin mining really does have a space in their lives. You know, it actually provides the security for Bitcoin transactions to, to go through. You know, powers the node operators to ensure that the hash rate's there for stability. When you have a trillion dollars of value on a chain, on a network, you want it to be secure. So the use of electricity isn't a waste, it's required, it's necessary. We're literally converting electricity into value, right? And, and making sure that people understand that that is ESG compliant through the sustainable energy mix, through the social impact it gives to people in third world countries, to governments via the governance component be from a decentralized network. I mean, we check all the boxes, but not to convince the fringe, but to make sure that the people in the masses understand that there is massive value and they shouldn't be afraid of it and they should use it every day. Yeah, I think to, to echo uh, Taras's point, the the narrative is being driven into the airwaves by those, those people. We're not trying to counteract the, the people that are driving the airwave, the narrative into the airwaves, but, but it's already there. So we're trying to meet it head on. So the people that are listening to that media are consuming that media can be educated and can hear the other side of the story and hopefully make their own opinion. Because if we don't, these headlines are just going to keep coming out and the people that don't understand, that don't do their own research, are going to believe that Bitcoin is bad because Bitcoin is, is boiling the ocean. That's what we're meeting head on. And for lots more ESG talk, and because this kind of makes you think, you know, how would you respond to some of the concerns and criticisms of ESG that it sort of pushes regulatory moats? Um, that it sort of encourages the misallocation of capital, that it could encourage the wrong type of operations from being set up, maybe operations that don't always optimize for profitability as current Bitcoin miners do. When you have huge subsidies potentially coming in from investment from ESG, you know, how much money did, say, Tesla get um, the last several years from ESG? I think it was somewhere like 4.9 billion or something like that. And that is a huge capital injection and so it can sort of incentivize the misallocation of capital as some people claim. How would you respond to that? Yeah, that's, it's interesting because I've spent a lot of time uh, talking to institutions and we, are, uh, we have a head of sustainability ourselves and we're building out our ESG framework and we're figuring out how to look at our disclosures and we're, we're trying to get guidance from ESG funds on what they want to see from us. And uh, the reality is ESG funds today are not 
allocating to crypto miners. Like that they're, they're not here and they're not gonna be here for a while. So we're pandering uh, from a capital markets perspective, we're pandering to people that actually aren't interested in playing our space yet. So we're kind of, there's a, there's a timing disconnect a little bit from where that capital's interested in being allocated and, and our space. Yeah, uh, I'll add to what Jamie said. I mean, in, in Canada, where I'm from, uh, there's a statement or saying, uh, you know, you skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck is today, right? And there's a ton of institutional capital looking at crypto mining, crypto minting as a long-term yield producing financial instrument. Um, you know, and that could be argued that's a good thing, it's a bad thing, because if big money really comes into Bitcoin, you know, does that pervert the original concept of what Bitcoin was supposed to be? To me, that's a side issue. I, I think that we need to address these capital holders to ensure that when they go to their investment committee and they say, listen, we've identified a great public company that we want to make a placement with, will they pass their ESG criteria? And you know, the EU is really probably the leader in the space on ESG requirements for investing, but North America is not immune. I mean, if you talk to any of the major institutional folks, ESG is extremely important these days. And for us to make sure that the Bitcoin Mining Council provides that industry sector-wide data that miners can rely on and could not possibly do on their own, I think there's massive value there. Yeah, I fully agree with what both of you said. And I, I think you know, when you look at uh, investors, uh, investors always attach rules to their money, right? Covenants as lenders. Uh, venture capitalists. I'm a general partner in a venture firm. I've run PE firms. Limited partners have requirements that, okay, if we're going to invest with you, here are rules. And there are a lot of ESG rules today because it's important to many investors um, that we deal with things like the environment, we deal with things like social inequality, and we make sure that companies are governed in a proper way. And so, you know, ESG is generally good for society, good for the planet. But regulations create cost increases and help focus companies. If you didn't have regulation, though, things would be going hog wild all over the place. So there's a certain amount of regulation that I think is good. And just you know, ESG is something that's important. We all need to contribute in our own way to it. And I think you know, we're trying to get there. So um, I guess we can sort of wrap it up on a final couple points. Um, uh, Tone, you seem to be the contrarian uh, to my right on, the, on those couches. So to you, what is the biggest potential threat of the Bitcoin Mining Council? Like, why is it that you're so... Uh, is, there, is there anything they said that assuaged some of your concerns? Do you still th uh, hold the current beliefs you did when you got on stage? Um, what is it you would like to see from the Bitcoin Mining Council moving forward in order for it to sit better with you and you think to sit better with uh, the Bitcoin mining community at large? Sure. Um, so the biggest threats are, of course, theoretical, and we are looking into the future with it, is it becomes an authority figure and a gatekeeper for you know, other miners going into the space. It becomes, um, uh, like a lot of other industries, as regulatory capture uh, to prevent other industries. And uh, the other concern is the uh, negotiation with um, some of the environmentalist um, expectations. Because one of the beauties of Bitcoin is it is so capitalistic that it changes the narrative. Uh, in, and in this case, uh, Bitcoin is meant to disrupt money from the government. It's not like the Gold Council and some of the other ones, I mean, uh, those industries are not as disruptive to the current gatekeepers of a lot of human control. And uh, having strict regulations on mining is a problem for the industry. So the more miners comply, uh, the harder it is for people to trust the Bitcoin network that it will stay as decentralized as it was. Uh, I mean, I was not a fan 
of miners leaving China. And this was a debate along my peers uh, where for me the concern was I liked that so much mining was in China because they didn't actually care about Bitcoin. They cared about the capitalistic side of Bitcoin. They, they were just mining because they were making money and protecting the network. And yeah, there was a large Bitcoin mining concentration in China. But to me, that decentralized Bitcoin because mining was in China, but most of the other Bitcoin services, the nodes, uh, the coding, the, even the concentration of coins are residing in other countries. Now that mining has left China, I think it's getting centralized in the West because now all the mining is going in the West and mining is way more regulated in the West. The fact that mining wasn't regulated in the Far East, I saw it as a good thing for the space. And the Bounty Council is that path towards more regulation that uh, would almost be enforced eventually onto miners. So it takes away that capitalistic angle. Uh, and um, I, I, mean, we, we, I mean, there's a few other concerns, but those are the really main ones that there could now be an authority. And just, just as a final point, is there anything that you'd like to see, I can pass you my mic, that like what, the final part of the question was what would the, what could the Bitcoin Mining Council do, if anything, to like sit better with you to say for you to say yes, this is a good idea? Well, ideally, it, it wouldn't just be a council; it would be just a once in a six month initiative, initiated by like, for example, right now, Bitcoin Core development is somewhat decentralized. You have companies that are invested in Bitcoin or Bitcoin companies that are sponsoring individual core developers. Um, I would rather see just an individual initiative. I would have personally rather saw MicroStrategies is looking to do an analysis and uh, hey, this is just a three month thing. We just want to get a snapshot of the ecosystem as you know, we will fund the research, uh, we will get the data, um, and then maybe six months later, some other company initiates it, right? So there wouldn't be this one authoritarian organization with members uh, that are there, like they'll have an incentive to stay members. Uh, I would rather see it uh, funded by the industry kind of in this randomized, decentralized fashion. And just for the rest of the panel, couple seconds for closing remarks and we can wrap it up. Yeah, I, I think that any new initiative that is viewed as threatening creates fear and it creates doubt. Uh, I personally think that the Bitcoin Mining Council's intentions are good and um, they're certainly not looking to drive more regulation because that just drives more cost to us as companies. So. Yeah, closing thoughts are the Bitcoin Mining Council's intention is 100% to support Bitcoin and the network and ensuring that the general public has the information they need to make informed decisions to use Bitcoin generally. Um, there was a lack of information around what were the inputs and now we're slowly opening up that veil so that the market knows, people know, users know, and more importantly, the people that are throwing FUD have a harder, much harder time to make numbers up that aren't real, right? And, and I think the information itself, it's like you shine light in a corner and the cockroaches scatter. So to deal with your question earlier around, you know, the folks that will be die hard and completely against it, I mean, you'll never win those folks, but it's the masses, the people here in the audience, the people at home listening, those are the people that really will benefit from what the BMC is doing. Uh, but your point is taken around, you know, getting individuals involved and I can tell you not a single person's been paid for the work at the BMC. It's been a 100% voluntary basis. Nobody gets a monetary incentive to join. It really is for the good of the industry. Yeah, I think uh, at, th at the beginning of the session, I said it's a loose collection and that, that really is what it is. There, 
there aren't a whole bunch of meetings happening. We've agreed to do a, some sort of quarterly data collection. Um, and really, that's the extent of it. But it's the opportunity to have a whole bunch of people with a common set of facts to counteract this tsunami of FUD that is facing our industry. And, and if, if not handled properly, could turn into an existential threat. Cool. On that note, I'd like to thank the panelists for coming on stage. Um, yeah, big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for your explanations, Bitcoin Mining Council members, and thank you for the excellent criticisms tone and kind of shedding light on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, that's it.